Segment 48, Galaxy Morphology and Spiral Density Waves. This is the image we looked at before of the Milky Way galaxy, which we're sitting in the middle of the plane of, and so we're looking in towards the center here, seeing the bulge, and seeing a dark lane where the dust clouds are in the plane, but then seeing the brightness of the disk as we look through it. Here's a picture of M83, a prominent nearby spiral galaxy, and when you look at this, you can notice a number of, of things about it that are very interesting. First of all, the yellow in the middle are, is the older population of stars that uh, are pretty much free of gas and dust and consists mostly of, of older, more reddish stars. The bluer regions in the spiral arms are, are younger stars that uh, are, include bunches of still hot stars that haven't evolved off the main sequence yet. And you also see in between the spiral arms these dust lanes where the clouds of gas and dust are forming into new stars and then right next to them the reddish regions which are H2 regions, regions with the very youngest stars, the O and B stars that are ionizing the gas around them. In the, in the time of World War II, Walter Bade, who was a, a scientist at uh, Caltech, discovered uh, the it, looking at other galaxies, that there were these two characteristic populations that I've just described. Population 1 includes the massive stars that are found in the disk and are rich in heavy elements. And population 2 doesn't include any massive stars, and they're largely found in the bulge, the central bulge, and the halo of the galaxies, and in globular clusters. And these stars are, are poor in heavy elements. Bada was was very fortunate. As a, as a German citizen, he wasn't... Um, he wasn't able to participate in the war effort along with his other uh, colleagues. That wouldn't have been too good an idea. Um, and because of the fear of a Japanese attack on the West Coast, the city of Los Angeles was blacked out at night. And as a result, the telescopes on Mount Wilson, which had been suffering from light pollution rather severely, were all of a sudden very good telescopes on a very dark site again. And Bada had them almost to himself. And so over the course of the war, he was able to make extensive observations of galaxies that led to this discovery of the old and young populations in the galaxies, which has then been uh, brought back to our understanding of our own galaxy as well. One of the th questions one has is, is in the nearby neighborhood of the sun, we might expect to be able to see some of these other stars as well. And how do we tell the difference between them. And the answer turns out to be by measuring their, their motion, either their proper motion or their radial velocity or both. The stars that are part of the disk population, which is the, the population one population, are all orbiting the center of the galaxy in the disk of the galaxy. And the ones nearby are moving along with the sun, which is doing that as well. So they have, first of all, very small velocities with respect to the sun. And second of all, a very regular pattern of velocities where the ones in, in two quadrants look redshifted and the other two quadrants look blue shifted with respect to the sun because of the components of their motion around the galaxy. But the stars in the halo uh, of the galaxy are on highly elliptical orbits that move in and out of the galactic plane and in and towards the center and out away from the center. And when those stars pass through the solar neighborhood, they have very, very high velocities, very, very large proper motions, and not in the directions that you would expect from this quadrant diagram. So kinematically, the two populations of stars are very easily distinguished. So you see that here. The population one stars have nice circular orbits shown on the left, and they're all moving together nearby. And it turns out they, in fact, are more metal rich. The population two stars on these uh, eccentric orbits have very high velocities nearby, and they, um, and, and they are very metal poor. These these orbits, the orbits that we see in particular for the population 2 star, are not closed orbits. That is to say, because they pass through a distributed mass, the shape of the orbit changes slightly on each pass. And so a star will never orbit exactly the same way twice. It's not like orbiting the sun, where you, the Earth follows the same path every time, because the Earth's not passing through the gravitational uh, uh, through the distributed gravitational field by, caused by lots of other objects. The other planets are basically not really uh, important in that respect. But in the galaxy where you're passing through all the stars in the disk, your, the exact distribution changes each time and so the orbits change with time. One of the interesting puzzles about spiral galaxies, which constitute a, a, a large fraction of the, of the other galaxies, is 
why the arms on the galaxies don't wind up. The inner part of the galaxy has a much higher angular velocity. That is, it, it, it turns a, a, around much more, more quickly. The stars in it go around their orbits much more quickly than the stars farther out. And so you'd expect over time that the spirals would get tighter and tighter and tighter. But in fact, most spiral galaxies have about the same degree of woundedness, and it's nowhere near what you would expect given the known age of these objects. So here is just an example. If you had objects that were, were moving more, more uh, quickly in angle at the center, and you had started out with straight lines, those straight lines would twist up and up and up and up. But after 15 billion years, in fact, th that they're not wound up at all. So what's going on? The answer turns out to be that the spiral arms are not, in fact, physical objects. They're waves. A good example of this kind of wave is a wave you see in, in, in traffic. If you get out on the Mopac and there's a wreck on the other side, you're moving along one side. What will happen is when you get close to the wreck, people will slow down to rubberneck. And then after they get past it, they'll speed back up again. So at the site of the wreck, the cars are packed close together and moving slowly. But before you get there and after you leave, the cars are farther apart and moving more quickly. The, the set of three or four cars right near the wreck that are always packed together is different at any given second. But there's always a density bump right there. So this is a wave that's past a standing wave in the system. It's a slight enhancement. And a spiral density wave is, is that kind of slight enhancement in the density of stars at a particular location. Um, it was discovered in the, in the 1960s that if you start a spiral wave going by having a series of elliptical orbits that are all turned slightly with each other, that this kind of a disturbance in a, in a disk galaxy is actually stable, unlike many other kind of disturbances you could imagine exciting by, by uh, passing another galaxy nearby or something, just like whacking on a bell produces a particular tone. This pattern of spiral waves in the galaxy is something that doesn't damp out in a single orbit. It takes many, many, many orbits for it to damp out. And so once you excite a spiral density wave in a galaxy, it will persist for a very long time. It turns out that the pattern of the spiral uh, travels slower than the gas and the stars o over much of the inner part of the disk of the galaxy. So stars and gas pass into the pattern, slow down, and then pass out of it again, getting somewhat more dense when they're slow, moving more slowly, just like in our traffic uh, analogy. So here's a, a, a set of pictures of different types of galaxies. And, and originally, people were just classifying them by their shapes before we understood what the motions were here. And so on the upper left, you see the spiral galaxies with a central bulge. And then emerging from that central bulb, a series of spiral arms wound more or less tight and, and tilted at different angles. On the right, you see what are called barred spiral galaxies that have their arms emerging from the end of a long bar of various degrees of thickness rather than from the, the, the bulge itself. And below you see a series of elliptical galaxies that, that essentially consist of all bulbs. They don't have any uh, spiral arms or any disk at all. And uh, these are ellipticals with, with different uh, uh, flatnesses to them as you, as you look down the sequence. Here's an, a couple of examples of different spirals seen edge on with different relative bulge sizes. On the left, what's called an SA galaxy with a very large bulge, and on the right, an SC galaxy with a very small bulge. And that dark lane you see is the disk of the galaxy with the, uh, the dust lane shown almost edge on so that you're seeing it obscuring the, the balance of the disk in both cases. Here's a picture of an elliptical galaxy. This is a giant elliptical in the middle of the Virgo cluster, M87. And those little dots you see around it are not stars, but globular clusters. This galaxy has, has a few thousand globular clusters associated with it. Um, and then a very, very massive uh, elliptical galaxy full of older stars that you're seeing here uh, pictured in yellow. So here's a diagram just showing the classifications. And this is purely a morphological classification from E0, which are the roundest galaxies, to E7, the flattest elliptical galaxies. And then the spirals classified as either normal spirals or barred spirals, where the ABC goes according to the prominence of the nuclear bulge. And then all the rest of the galaxies that don't quite fit this pattern, most of which are small galaxies, are called irregular galaxies.